Uh, well, uh, I'm hoping that you can manage to stay awake for the next uh, 45 minutes. Uh, we have three panelists who are busy making their way uh, to um, sit down. Um, so my name is Giles Wall. I'm not on the program, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> interesting enough, uh, I as at, was actually born in Kenya, so I hope that I'm not going to be an example of Kenyan mortality in front of you. Um, so I shall try and stay alive for the next 45 minutes. Um, I'm a regular visitor to Zimbabwe, so uh, some of you will know me. Um, if you don't, come up and introduce yourself afterwards. Um, we have uh, three panellists. Um, who are with us, uh, Neil and David, you've already seen this morning, uh, Nikki Patchett, who many of you will you know, uh, will know as uh, her role at All Mutual. Um, so you're, uh, you know who you're talking with. Um, now, uh, we thought uh, what could be as boring as mortality tables, and so, so we, we decided that we would do a um, panel discussion about uh, SAM, the uh, Solvency Assessment and Management, the South African version of Solvency 2. Um, and um, SAM is a baby that is now three years old, four years old. Okay, it hasn't yet been born, obviously, uh, but, but uh, uh, we will, um, uh, birth is imminent, uh, 1st of January 2016, if everything goes according to plan. Good, okay, we're, I'm getting nods from everybody, so, so, so we, we uh, haven't had any postponement yet. Um, and uh, it's been, uh, how can I put it? a gestation period uh, of some pain, a lot of hard work, um, uh, but we hope the results are going to be worthwhile. Okay, well, we, we, um, some of you, of course, aren't aware of SAM, so um, we, we have discussed it at previous Actuarial Society of Zimbabwe seminars, so if you weren't there, it's your own fault, uh, but we are going to attempt a, a five-minute summary so that you at least have some idea of uh, what we're talking about. Okay, so, so um, uh, everybody talks about SAM being three pillars. Um, we're going to get an introduction to those pillars, but, but maybe I can just do a, um, a little uh, sort of uh, chat about them, and then we're going to have a description of what's happening uh, in South Africa. Okay, so pillar one, so the idea is, you need to hold up a roof in front of you, and to, to hold up a roof, you need um, pillars to support the roof. So pillar one uh, is um, to ask the question, how much money do you need in an insurance concern? So we're talking life insurance and short-term insurance. How much money do you need, um, first of all, to make sure you can meet your liabilities, and second of all, to make sure that even if times go bad, you can still meet your liabilities. Pillar two um, is about um, the way you manage your business, so the way you assess your risk, the way you decide what risk you can take on, and the way you go through the management of that. And then pillar three is um, about the public side of it, how are you going to demonstrate to um, outside parties, um, uh, particularly to the regulators, but uh, other people as well, how can you demonstrate that uh, you are managing your business properly and that you are appropriately solvent? Okay, so um, what I have asked our panelists to say is how does what's happening under SAM differ from what currently happens in South Africa. So uh, David fortunately is um, the uh, chair of uh, one of the portions of the Pillar 1 task force, so he is the ideal person to speak to. Uh, thanks Charles. Um, I vaguely recall that the gestational period of the elephant is something like 21 months, 18 months, okay? And we're now on sort of four or five years so the thing we're going to create is going to be significantly bigger than an elephant. Uh, okay, so pillar one is the most technically complex, perhaps. It has uh, something that's reasonably familiar. The assets, 
are valued at market value wherever possible. So from a size and context, that's not anything strange or new, but it's market value for all the assets. And the liabilities or actuarial reserves have got a new name. The name is technical provisions. But it's a liability, it's the reserve, it's the mathematical reserve, it's the actuarial reserve. It's also a gross premium valuation, a best estimate discounted view of future premiums and expenses, discounted back to the current time. And uh, with one exception, no margins. No discretionary margins, no compulsory margins, no first year margins, nothing, with this one exception, that defers profit in the future. So in many ways, it is a very much less conservative liability measure than what many of us have been used to. The one margin that does exist is a thing called a risk margin, which is a direct function of the capital requirements. So we calculate the capital requirements, and the risk margin that you add to the reserves is a function of how much capital you have to hold. The, and this principle applies across life insurers and general insurers. So it's a very familiar idea for life insurers, but maybe a little less familiar for general insurers. The capital requirement is a complex structural model looking at a whole set of risks of underwriting risks and market risks and credit risks and operational risks. And each of those are decomposed into even more detailed risk levels with a detailed calibration for each of those. So we would calculate the liabilities on a shocks mortality basis. We used to say what happens if claims are higher for general insurance. And all of those shocks are attempted to be calibrated to the worst thing that could happen in a one in 200 year scenario. So it's a, a fairly specific calibration, quite a conservative calibration, and as I'm sure many of you think of it, it's quite an uh, artificial theoretical calibration of how certain we are about the one in 200 year events. We then aggregate all those individual sub risks into the total amounts, allowing for different levels of diversification benefits. So in the past, we've been very crude, we've assumed that most things are pretty much independent. Now we actually assume some level of dependence and independence depending on what sort of risks they are. And that gets aggregated up into our capital requirements. So for most insurers, what's happened is the reserves, the technical provisions have come down. So the net asset value of the surplus has gone up. But for most insurers, the capital requirement has also gone up. This is an offsetting impact. We've got more available surplus, but also a higher capital requirement. That's more than 30 seconds, but it's all I can do. Now we look at pillar two, um, and pillar three. So pillar two, as Giles said, is kind of how we manage companies. It's got to do with governance. And I think for me, this is the most useful part of Solvency 2 and SAM, and it's something that actually, whilst the, the detailed technical calculations may or may not be relevant to other countries, I think that the governance and the risk management is relevant throughout the world. And I think it's very much what we should have been doing. So essentially it's around, we need to make sure there's a proper risk management framework in place in the company. We need to identify the, risk, the risks, measure them, manage them, and essentially we need to know what we're dealing with. We're taking on policies, but what kind of risks are we being exposing the company to? Um, I think the other thing which is, which is different to the past is in the past I think you kind of had your risk officers looking at sort of operational risk and fraud and things like that and then you had your appointed actuary or your statutory actuary looking at the insurance type risks um, and you know maybe board level they sort of discuss the risk. What, what this is doing is bringing much more together, much more holistic view. Um, risk management framework has to be signed off by the board and it, it means that you have to have a culture of risk management and risk awareness throughout the whole company from you know fr from the people who who type in the client details all the way through to the board. And it has meant in South Africa a lot more discussions around risk, a lot more really interesting, really good discussions, the board really thinking about what is it that we are um, leading this company to do, what kind of risks do we want? And actually we don't want those kind of risks, we don't want to write that kind of business and so let's stop writing it. So that's, um, I think for me, the big change is now a holistic view and it's all the way through the company. Another part of the, the pillar two is the stress testing and this, this thing called the ORSA and the ORSA report. And certainly for me, the, this ORSA has terrified me. Um, I've not actually signed off on my first ORSA and I'm in the process of, of, of signing off on the second one. And actually, it's not so bad. It's really just, it's just actually saying, what is the entirety of a risk framework? Put it all together, do some stress tests, which are very similar 
you know, again, in South Africa, we used to be told the Ross Street is through, we had to submit them annually to the FSB. Now they're saying, define your own stress What are the risks that you're um, taking on? Stress those elements that affect those risks, and what does it do to you? What is actually going to make you insolvent? What are the things you really need to watch? So the big difference is we've got to set our own stress test. But in the essence, it's very similar to a financial condition report, which I know people in Zimbabwe are more, know more about. That's pillar two. Um, pillar three, as John said, is really kind of how do we show what we're doing. And I think the FSB, uh, so we've just started filling in our first draft of the full return to investment to the FSB. And they have said that they intend to be both intrusive and invasive. And having filled in the forms, they are both intrusive and invasive. There's a lot of information they're requiring, a lot of detail. Um, our old long-term returns also have a fair amount of detail, but this has got a whole lot more. And, we, and there's a lot more that we report on quarterly than we used to. And I guess my question is, it's great to be able to get all that information. Companies put a lot of time and effort and money into being able to produce all this information. But if the regulator can't use it, they're not set up to actually use all that information. It's a waste of everybody's time and money. So hopefully they will have some fancy systems that can go through everything, um, because there's a lot of information out there. OK, uh, so um, we... Uh can summarize it in the space of a few minutes. Uh, so why has it taken four or five years um, to give birth? And uh, I, I'd like to say that South African babies are born quicker than European babies, because they've been uh, at it for the last 10 years, and uh, there's the one who knows whether they're actually going to get there. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask Neil um, uh, what actuaries have been doing over this uh, time, and uh, how have they contributed? Thank you. I think I'm also just going to lift that for you. So, um, if I didn't know any better, I would have thought that Sam was uh, dreamt up by a bunch of actuaries. Uh, because it, uh, there's a lot of actuaries involved and it actually meant a lot of job opportunities. So, um, also in the UK, there's so many people working on solvency too and, and similarly in, in South Africa. And uh, for the, the, uh, the South Africa, or the, the actual Society of South Africa, we've got so many members working on the, the, the SAM steering committee. Just on that main steering committee, I think we've got about um, 30 people involved there. And then we'll see all those various subcommittees under the various pillars. So under pillar one, there's six subcommittees. And in each subcommittee, there's a bunch of actions. In Pillar 2, there's three um, subcommittees and there's a bunch of action in each of those committees. And then under Pillar 3, there's also there's two committees and there's a bunch of action in those committees as well. So I don't uh, have the exact numbers. One of our, our um, actions at the F we used to be at the FSB, she, I couldn't get all of that presentation, but she actually just showed how many actions are involved in SAM. I can't remember, but it was a very high number. So got it here, plus minus 70. Um, the, the amount of hours actually spent um, working with the FSB and so on. So that's only with, with the FSB. Now again, in the companies themselves, obviously they've got their own committees and so on, and hiring external consultants and so on. That's why David is smiling here to my right. There's a lot of uh, work for, for, for companies, uh, consulting companies and so on. And uh, just for the FSB, also if you look at the right, just the range of stakeholders that they need to interact with, because obviously it impacts on financial statements. So you'll have the the, the Institute of, of Chartered Accountants involved. Um, you'll have uh, um, the ERBA, the auditors involved. You'll have the the, the the Industry Association for Insurers and so on involved. So it's just if you actually start to unpack it. And you just look at the, the matrix of different stakeholders and people involved, it is really a, a massive undertaking. Sorry, where, where we, uh, I, I could see Nick, Nicky reach into the microphone, but I, I'm going to move on to the next question, uh, which, which is um, so. Is it really worth it then? Uh, what, what, what are we going to get out of it? 
uh, what's the benefit and um, maybe what is the um, cost, what's, what's going to be the impact on the industry. So um, uh, Nikki said a little bit about uh, sort of how good the discussions have been at the, uh, uh, at the board uh, levels. Uh, is there anything else to say in uh, praise of Sam? It's um, a bit of a hot potato to toss you, uh, Nikki, but maybe I'll pass to you. I think one of the things that we've seen in South Africa, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's in the UK, is that the Chief Risk Officer and the appointed actually are working much more closely together. Um, so I think that they have to. Um, the also, so in South Africa, the also is signed off by the Chief Risk Officer, um, but the appointed actuary or the head of the actual control function has to sign off on a number of elements of that. So there's a sort of a dual sign off there. But it's actually brought Chief Risk Officers and Point Actuaries much closer together. So there's been much more sharing of risk management, which I think is good for the companies and for industry as a whole. And in fact, in a number of South African companies, the Chief Risk Officer and the Point Actuary have started to become the same person. Um, they sort of put it together. Um, and we have a number of our big insurers who have an actuarial CRO is also the point of actuary. Um, and I just, yeah, as, as I said before, I think this, it's looking at risks holistically it's, it's, and it's getting it throughout the company. So when you're looking at allocating capital, it's actually, am I, what kind of risk will this capital taking on? I think those are very important discussions that we probably should have been having all the time and maybe some companies were, but some weren't. Yeah, I think some of that comes through just having a risk-based capital framework. Well, life insurance, we've had that stomach for a while, it wasn't perfect, but we've had risk-based capital, so the idea of which products were more or less risky has been there. But for general insurers, until very recently, it was still a very crude approach, and in my own experience, there have been uh, harder discussions and more sort of uh, uh, introspection from general insurers understanding, well, this crop insurance business that I'm writing has got horribly small margins and huge amounts of volatility and huge amounts of capital. Do I really want to be doing this? Which is impossible, the margins aren't great, but it still looks like I'm making money. I think those discussions have been worth have really been accelerated. Um, I, mean, I think out of the revised, refined, improved risk based capital calculation, there's been an appreciation that maybe risk products are actually more risky and more capital intensive than we thought they were in the past. So you know, that's maybe bad news in terms of pricing, but it is perhaps a more active focus on, on, on the risk here as well. Um, one of the big criticism, in fact one of the very few criticisms of our financial regulation environment from the, the IMF was that from a group supervision, how the regulator supervises groups of insurers or banks and insurers was maybe a little bit ad hoc in the past. Sam's taken several steps forward towards trying to create a framework for group supervision, worrying about how risks within an organization are managed, whether intergroup transactions are considered properly. I don't think we're there perfectly. It's been one of the more problematic areas and one of the bigger changes, but I think a better focus on groups and big groups and what sort of risk that poses uh, is, is quite important. Um, I guess another sort of pet bug bear of mine has been the sometime misuse of financial reinsurance or reinsurance in general, where you think or pretend you've got certain benefits, but in practice you don't. I've always felt that we didn't have enough guidance to treat this properly in the past, but it was a bit vague. And people did things very, very differently. Sam hopefully makes that a lot clearer around how much protection you actually allow us to get credit from, from your reinsurer. If, for example, you sold products for the 10 year product term but your re and 10 year guarantees on premium rates, but your reinsurer has got the ability to reprice you every year, you don't actually have a lot of protection. And so Sam forces them to recognize that you've only got one year of protection from the reinsurer because beyond that point, in a very extreme scenario, Reinsurer could reprice you and you wouldn't have the protection that you thought. That's given rise to some changes. It's given rise to people revisiting the reinsurer strategies. Um, and aside from it, it's also trying to the reinsurer that the risk that they have are maybe uh, worse than they thought. So, those are just some of the areas that for me actually have been positive moves and worthwhile and really coming to expose some risks that weren't there before. And also, if you take a bit of a step back and look at the uh, international arena, the South Africa's financial services sector and our regulations and so on is ranked very highly in the world. So, if the move, w most of the world is moving to a certain direction and we still want to be perceived as 
having a very robust financial services sector, we've got adequate regulation and protection and so on for members. It's also uh, important in that context as well. I mean, on, on that note, um, so when the SAM project started in South Africa, the informal mandate was that we wanted third country equivalents to Solvency II, which would mean that a European insurer with a South African subsidiary could apply the SAM calculations to that subsidiary and just use that for Solvency II purposes in Europe. That was kind of the, 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 the view. But in actual fact, the, again, the criticism from the IMF was that there were areas where we weren't compliant with the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, the IAIS's insurance core principles. And when pushed on that, our regulator did say, no, actually, what they have to do is they have to comply with the insurance core principles. And that talks to Neil's point about a consistent approach around regulation, really around the world. Almost all the insurance regulators are either at or trying to comply with the insurance core principles, and that, I think, is a worthwhile endeavor. Although those rules are also fairly, fairly broad. Third country equivalents in its own rights this may be helpful for uh, an old mutual actually, or some of our reinsurers who are domiciled in Europe. Uh, there was a view that perhaps it makes foreign investment into South Africa easier. I remain a bit skeptical. It certainly makes it easier for South African firms to buy insurers <coughs> in developed markets, which isn't really happening anymore. And actually, protection makes it a lot more onerous and expensive to buy insurers in emerging markets and then have to apply some level of this fairly expensive heavyweight SAM governance too. So I guess, you know, if I could have done things again, or if actually anybody had asked me, which they don't, they probably wouldn't again, <laughs> looking towards insurance core principles and a general set of international things, that seemed like a pretty good idea. Third country equivalents, I'm not convinced of how useful it is, particularly for emerging markets. If I can just add to that, and I think <clears throat> we've seen some new the, the capital directive that came out last year in Zimbabwe, um, and we've seen a very similar capital directive actually come out in Malawi at the beginning of this year. And I think that, and, and, and I don't know if there is anyone from IPEC here, but looking at that, I can see there is certainly a move towards IIS principles around kind of leading to something around at the moment. Zimbabwe has a $2 million capital requirement. So the, the looking at the admissible assets, all those kind of things, is an attempt to kind of bring some risk-based modeling or some risk-based um, measurement into Zimbabwe and how we met with our, our, our capital. So I think that, you know, that there is not only this IAS, it's also the SADC countries have also got their own sort of insurance regulator, re regulatory forum. And they obviously are all talking, um, and I'm just going back me up on this, because also a um, statutory company in, in Malawi. The wording in the Malawian and Zimbabwe directives were identical in some portions. So there's obviously that, that they're all trying to, to do that, and that's a good thing. I think the risk-based capital, making companies look at their risks, is very important. That's something that we should be encouraging the regulator on. So I don't know if there is anyone here from a regulator who maybe wants to comment on that. Sorry, experience says, says uh, if, if, I, if I'm a regulator, I hate being put on the spot. So, so, so if you'd like to comment privately afterwards, that would also be understandable. Um, uh, but but if, if you are uh, happy to say something, please. <laughs> I give you the option to comment privately. Okay, so... so uh, Thank you. Uh, I, th I think that's very useful because um, one of the questions that, that, that I'd like to ask, which I think we've almost covered, is what we would, would you have done differently uh, if we'd have known uh, five years ago what we know now? Have you got anything else you want to add to that? <laughs> no. I, th I think um, there's just so much a regulatory reform going on in South Africa currently. We've got our TCF legislation coming in, or it's actually already in. We've got retirement reform. We've got the retail distribution review. We're moving from a, 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 to a Twin Peaks regulatory regime. So there's so much things happening uh, at, at one point in time. And uh, people are struggling to, to straddle both focusing on the, the business uh, uh, objectives and also keeping the regulator happy. I think 
from my perspective, um, and, and it's interesting, so we've gone to the third country a couple of and we've got these really complicated technical provisions and how you set your assumptions. And certainly, I don't think those kind of, particularly around, you know, market, equivalent market consistent and you use a yield or use a yield curve or the stock curve or the guild curve or whatever, you know, th those are not relevant in other countries. And I think perhaps some of the complexity we've put in on South Africa to be third country equivalent isn't even necessarily that appropriate for South Africa. So I think maybe we could have sim simplify some of that. Sorry, David. Um, um, and then also, along with the governance, there's a lot of very rules-based things and maybe it could be a little bit more principles-based. Um, and again, maybe not so much for South Africa, I think the also is a good thing, but again, that could be simplified and certainly for some of the other countries, I think we should really, the, the principles are really good, um, but maybe it could have been a little bit simpler. For me, I would say that would be... Uh, Nick, I don't take offense because all the complicated parts were at mine. Um, so I think it has been a, a, a lot of change at, at one time. Uh, especially in life insurance, our pillar one equivalent wasn't bad. We could uh, potentially, instead of going this whole new way, just kind of tweaked and adjusted that and got that improved over time. I think on the general insurance side, the improvements were necessary, but again, you know, we kind of aged to there before, Sam. The alternative view from that is that you don't really want death by a thousand cuts. You don't want to have you know, 10 years of changing regulations every single year. But potentially kind of a longer term view where things are heading and, and making smaller tips, getting people to use it, I think would, would definitely be worthwhile. Um, and on, on the yield curve thing, I mean, it's a, maybe it's a slightly unrelated point, but by specifying a single yield curve, you do start to drive some odd behaviors in the market because you know, everybody's trying to hedge off the exact same single view and cause the social, and even a fairly liquid market in South Africa. And on the rest of the continent, most markets aren't very liquid, so we need to be very, very careful of this. I would be absolutely with that. Um, I think we are going to talk about the economic impact study in a moment. The economic impact study in South Africa was basically completed earlier this year, started a couple of years back, but also was done uh, after most of the important decisions had been made. As we look at 22, you want to be able to do the economic impact study to work out what is the impact on the economy of these new regulations, we you've got a reasonably good idea of what the regulations are. But on the other hand, in determining what the regulation should be and what the direction is, how much this thing is going to cost us, it might have been useful to do some sort of lightweight economic impact study or quick exercise rather than start to say, do we even want to go down this path? And if I recall, it's going back a while, I think Turkey took the decision to test out one of the European quizzes to see what it would mean for them before making final decisions on how far they want to go. I think that's a really worthwhile step. You're going to do such a big change, take a breath, take a look at it, and decide what is the best way to go forward. So I think uh, you're, you're uh, a good manager, but I, you can hear me at the back, can't you? Yeah. Uh, and that's, you can over here at the front. The, um, uh, that, that is actually my next question, which is um, for implementing SAD, uh, what are the kind of uh, skills that need to be attained? Um, how much effort is involved? Who needs to be involved? Um, uh, have you seen co companies struggling to uh, get the resources on board to be able to do what they need to do? So I think everyone will have lots to say. Let me start. I mean, it has been a significant exercise. It has been an expensive exercise. South insurers have spent Billions of rands getting ready for Sam. And there are benefits, Nikki and I have spoken about some of those benefits, there are benefits, but it is sometimes perhaps hard to work on how you reconcile that with a figure of several billion rand of, of expenses and several hundred million rand of ongoing expenses every year complying with new rules. So there are very, very significant costs involved. And the way we've done it is significantly cheaper than the way many insurers in the UK went about it. So we, we, we haven't even gone uh, or, all the way that we might have. So it's been very, very expensive. Um, originally, the, the sand project was mostly set up by uh, several actuaries in a, in a dark room. And every now and again, people would just slide a new piece of paper under the door, and there'd be some smoke and lights, and another piece of answer would come out from under the door. And that was great, lots of fun for actuaries. But it also meant that all the broader issues around the organization, 
the, what does this mean for the business? What does this mean for our systems? Where are we going to get the data from? Are we going to have to change our products? A lot of the non-actuarial, the fundamentally important issues were maybe kind of overlooked for a while while these things were in actuarial mode. So there's been significant involvement from actuaries. I think that is necessary. And uh, certainly it's done a lot for the actuaries in South Africa with those relevant skills. There's been very high demand. So any country with a few skills, that's definitely going to be a constraint. But a lesson for me is that it needs to involve all the different parts of the organization in the products to actually have these things uh, working effectively. I think for me, I think where there's been a lot of education is actually at board level. Because in the past, the board pretty much relied on the statutory actuary. If they signed off, they made a recommendation, everybody just sort of nodded their heads and said, yes, we'll go with what the statutory actuary recommends. But now the board is responsible. And while there is still some reliance on the on the statutory actuary or the actual control function, a lot of boards have had to get actuaries onto their boards. And there's had to be a lot of education by the appointed actuary or actual advisors to the board so they understand the risks they're actually taking on. What does this mean? What are risk appetites? What kind of things should we be looking at? What is solvency? What what are what what are what are those assumptions that you're using? Because the board has to approve the assumptions. Um, and I think for companies where there is an actuary on the board, it places a lot of responsibility on that actuary. Um, and I think for, for there are, and particularly I think on the short term side, there are companies where there aren't actuaries on the boards. And I think they've struggled a lot and there's had to be a lot of education. Again, for the big boards where they've got 15, 16 directors and they've got seven different committees and all the works on the committee, it's been much easier. I think for the small companies where you've got maybe three, maybe maybe five directors and you've actually got even audit and risk committee and maybe you've got a, a, a REMCOM because you have to have a REMCOM. You know, and, and actually they're all accountants and maybe there's one lawyer. It, it's been a much harder process. Um, so there's been a lot of education there. Um, I think also a lot of the small companies have outsourced a lot of the actuarial work, the doing the technical revisions. Uh, the risk management system has to be done in-house. Actually, you, you cannot outsource a CRO role. So you can outsource the head of actuarial control function role, but you cannot source outsource the CRO role. And that risk management framework has to be done in the company. I think that's also been, you know, it's not so much an actuarial uh, development, but there's been a lot of development on that side in companies. And they've had to also get a lot of external consultants to small companies to help advise them. But in the end, those risk policies, those risk, that risk framework has to be a product of the company itself. Just in terms of the the resources that the regulator, that's also very important because uh, there's actually been a shift from a more compliance-based tick box type of approach to a more like Nick mentioned the intrusive type approach where you actually need to understand what's going on in the company. So you actually need uh, higher level type people employed in, at the regulator. And then you've got the challenge of keeping people employed at the regulator. Because uh, obviously it's part of uh, it's a state type organisation. So obviously, uh, at normal private companies will off will be able to offer higher salaries and so on. So we, what we've seen in South Africa is a lot of the senior actuaries at the regulator has actually moved um, to other uh, companies, and it seems that they struggle to find the uh, right skilled people to actually uh, be employed there. So it's also something that, that definitely needs to be uh, all in mind. Okay, um, uh, thank, thank you uh, to our panelists so far. Now, um, we did want to make sure we left a little bit of time for questions from the floor because um, uh, we might not be hitting the button. Um, so, uh, if you've got any questions, please ask away. We have a question right at the back. Can you shout from there or can, uh, should we get your microphone? Uh, my question maybe is coming from what Nikki said, uh, where she said that we have seen the role of the chief, chief risk officer and the role of the chief actuary in some big companies maybe coming together into making it one role, so wearing one person, uh, wearing the two years. Is, is that necessarily a, a good thing, uh, having one person wearing the two years or having two separate people wearing the different years? Okay. Uh, should we have a two-headed person or not? Um, uh, um, I think it depends. I think it. I think the the roles overlap a lot. 
Um, and that, that and, 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 and yes, the person in that role needs to have certain skills. Um, so they need to have a, so if they're, well, they would have to be an actuary if they were their point actuary as well. So like Momentum has a CRO, the point actuary reports into the CRO, but the CRO is not an actuary. I think they're an engineer. I think he's an engineer. Anyway, so so you need to have very good answers. So the person needs to be important, and the person needs to understand risk and risk management. Um, and then obviously, if they are, you know, if, if they're going to be the point actually as well, they have to have all the appropriate qualifications for a point actually. Um, so I think it can work because there's a lot of overlap. Even if it's not one person's two people, they need to work very closely together. Um, and I think that's something that where you've outsourced the one role, and, and, and certainly for one of my South African companies, so I'm an outsourced statutory actuary, um, and they have an internal CRO, and we're going to have to work much more closely together in future than we have done in the past. In years gone by, um, even if the uh, chief actuary wasn't the risk officer, I think typically he or she took on a lot of that role in any case, implicitly. And I know of very large South African insurers, the absolute largest, where there was a risk function, but any time a serious risk came up and they actually wanted real input, they almost end up ignoring them and moving back to the chief actuary in any case. You know, the, the risk function often was a very narrow view of just sort of operational risk and maybe a bit of credit and, and not much else. So I think naturally, I've actually, Actuaries have been playing more of the risk role historically in any case, but oftentimes there's some holes in the skill set. Operational risk being a big one, credit risk fairly often being one, and, and maybe more, more broadly as well, but like the, the actuarial, the underwriting, the reserving, the, the much of the marked risk, the reinsurance, uh, a lot of those risks which are fundamental to insurance business, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, the actuaries really got a very good risk view on. And as it actually has been required to express a view on several solvency, hopefully there was some broader consideration of, of other things. Uh, actuaries and controls and documentation may not the strongest, so boosting the control environment certainly is positive. <coughs> so you can have an actuary who happens to know and has specifically developed the operational risk and their controls and their credit risk skills to have the whole set, that's possible, and then I think that one person fulfill both, both roles. You can also have maybe a more traditional risk officer who's tried very hard to get that understanding of the actual, the insurance, the reinsurance side, and that can also work. Maybe I'm biased because I'm an actuary. That feels to me slightly more difficult given the history of risk officers we've had in South Africa, where it hasn't been perhaps as senior a role until fairly recently as maybe has been in some other European countries or even in the US where the, risk, the chief risk officer really has been the be-all and end-all of risk. Um, there was one or two clients where I'm involved in where the division of this role between two people actually does cause a little bit of nervousness and, and who's stepping on toes and who's involved there and who's working well. But to Nikki's point, you need to work well and it's not always absolutely straightforward. You actually work at really, really hard. Sounds like marriage. The, uh, uh, we've got time for one more question. Uh, another one at the back there. Um, mine is on the issues to do with international regulation, regulation for the financial service sector and so forth. Um, I just wrote a, a simple statement here to say um, international standardization of regulation simply, to me, is an aligning of all financial systems, sort of like dominoes, so that a simple nudge can cause international collapse. My question really is to say, if you're spending all those years developing systems uh, to standardize the um, financial service sector, are we not also, from a different perspective, able to um, develop a, a tailor-made solution for each individual financial market player, so that it's, at least there's some minimization of issues to do with hating and so forth? Okay, so um, uh, if we're all aligning, does that mean that systemic collapse is going to be more likely rather than less? Hmm, interesting question. Uh, David's reaching for the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not because I have all the answers. I don't think you want to say something. I want to make sure I get my reason first. Um, so, systemic risk has been 
possibly the, the biggest thing on our financial regulator's mind in the last few years. And in doing the economic impact study for them, the point they kept coming back to, yes, 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 the expenses, but think how much this is going to reduce our systemic risk. If we reduce the probability of a systemic failure caused by insurers by a tiny fraction, that will have huge, huge benefits. So as part of the process to come up with new regulations, systemic risk and uh, group risk within a group and cross-border risk has absolutely been a priority. So I guess you could say, well, is having just different regulations, giving a little bit of diversification, preventing hurting behavior, is that better than designing a consistent, coherent, maybe slightly hurt encouraging system that really actually pays attention to systemic risk? Uh, I don't know, it's a good question. And there, there, there have been some concerns around sort of the risk of hurting by specifying a discount rate. We now, if the bond rates, the bond yield curve, the prescribed bond yield curve is the only thing that counts as risk free, everybody's encouraged to go and hedge and match with the specific instruments that underlie that yield curve. It actually starts to interfere with capital markets and having a knock-on effect. So I think the question on hurting behavior is really, really worthwhile. But I guess I'm a little bit nervous if we, we, we don't actually look at this, but we just try to do things differently, that that will necessarily achieve those objectives either. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you, you talked about having individual uh, regulation of each insurer. Um, and I think that you can, you can so, so for the capital model, you can use the standard formula, or you can develop your own internal model. Um, I think they're actually called internal models. Um, and in the UK, I think it was in compulsory to develop an internal model, or very much encouraged. encouraged, and most people went that way. In South Africa, we were given the option, and we have across the short term and long term over 100 licenses, and initially seven companies came forward and said they were going to develop their own internal model, um, of which two were life companies, one was a large life company, and one was a small niche life insurer. Uh, the large company has now decided they're no longer applying for an internal model, they're going to stick to the standard formula. Because developing an internal model is incredibly expensive and it becomes very um, judgmental because you've got to calibrate every single assumption and in some cases it's just the data is just not out there. So you're kind of going, mm, okay well let's We'll just go for this, but you come with this really fancy model that, yeah, at the end, but at the end, it's still all based on a bunch of assumptions which are may, may not be completely true to life. So I think certainly with the internal model, that was kind of what they were trying to get to, and they really wanted people to go that way. But in the end, it comes down to it still ends up being very assumption based, and if your assumptions can be based on data, and a lot of them in the insurance industry can't be actually how much use is that individual model and individual uh, regulatory? Uh, so, so, so one of the ways I look at it is that you need, sorry, we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, <laughs> we can bring to a one or two hundred year scenario. The usual model rule of thumb is you need about 10 data points in that area to give you a reasonable estimate. So 10 data points, one or two hundred years, you're going to need 2,000 years worth of data, but the data all needs to be relevant. So you need about 2,000 years worth of data in the last 10 years. So yeah, it, it really it's always going to come down to, to judgment. The one point I will say is that at the same time as our regulators have been very worried about systemic risk, I'm less worried in the insurance sector. Banks are inherently fragile. I mentioned we've had some 20 bank failures in Africa and literally hundreds of bank failures in the US since the global financial crisis. They don't always make the news, but there have been many, many hundred failures. Because of the fractional reserve in the fragile nature of the interbank transactions, you know, if a single insurance company fails, you know, that, that's a bad thing. But it's very difficult for one insurer failing to cause the entire insurance sector to fall down. There can be confidence is issues, but it's a very different sort of model in the banking world. And whilst it's really important, we should also be careful not to overstate the, 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 the risk there with insurers by comparing ourselves to, to banks. The last word goes to Neil, so he can say one enough. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> now, I think uh, we, we just need to realize that we're part of a global village and also we've already got the international accounting standards and so on. So, uh, I think it's just uh, uh, we need to be able, or it helps a lot if you can compare yourself um, to other countries and, and, and for foreign investment and those type of things. If it's more or less a, 
on the same standard and standards of reporting and they know it's a similar way and we've got it in the in the like the technology where it's uh, where it's global and everything needs to speak to one another so if you had your own internet this internet or uh, it wouldn't have been able to, to talk to any other countries and so on so i think it's just uh, uh, realizing you're part of a global village Great. I, I'm sorry if, if uh, for those of you who've got uh, other questions, we're, we're out of time. Um, I, think, I think we'd like to uh, thank our panelists uh, very much, and particularly uh, we'd like to thank uh, Nian and David, who uh, are running out of the room at the end of this to go and catch a plane to various parts of the world. So let's thank them in their usual way.